So the question is, how would we synthesize this final product from the alkene of our choice? Mm -hmm. So our goal is we have to make this final product using any alkene. So I was thinking that you have like a, like you'd have the thing with the oxygen but without the chlorine and then you would just change the double, the pi bond to a chlorine. That's what we were thinking and we started using um, HBr and peroxides. So let's see, it seems to me like, so let's number our carbons here. One, two, three, four, five, six. So doing retrosynthesis, it seems like it's clear that we used to have an alkene. Where do you guys think the double bond used to be? On the one. Between which two atoms? One and two. Yeah, between one and two. So maybe we might have started with this. So to me, it seems like we can just do this. When they say the alkene of your choice, does that mean that we could have the oxygen in the original alkene? If it were an alkene. Right, but yeah. I'm saying like, if Yes, have, that's right. I mean, we can have oxygen. That's right. All right, is this the right answer? This would be my answer. answer. Yeah, this is it. Okay. Oh, okay, I understand. So let's go through the mechanism. Thing connected. I was like, instead of using like H2O, we use like uh, propyl. Okay, that makes sense. Let's go through the mechanism for that. Corns.
important uh, problem, so let's discuss how this worked here. So this is a pretty standard reaction. We have that whole bogus uh, temporary dipole story that explains why uh, a diatomic halogen would attack a carbon-carbon double bond, and that gives us our chlorinium cyclic ion. Again, I think some of you thought that the second chloride would now attack, but as we were discussing maybe earlier today, we're more likely to have the alcohol come in and attack because we should be thinking of this as the solvent. We're using this alcohol as a solvent. There's way more alcohol than chlorides, so the alcohol will come in before the chloride comes in. Now, why would the oxygen attack the number two and not the number one? Because it's sodium right there. Well, of course, that's what we want. But remember, we can't, we can't assume that the molecules will do what we want. How, how do we know that it wants to attack the number two and not the number one? Because more substituted, so the carbocation would be more stable right. over there. That's the issue we were talking about a minute ago. Really, there's carbocation character on both the number one and the number two carbon over here. But the number two has more carbocation character because it's better able to stabilize that carbocation character because it's more substituted. So we can trust that the oxygen really will attack the number two. And then all we need is a deprotonation for the last step. And I guess you could use either the alcohol or the chloride to do that last deprotonation. And that would get us to here. So this is one of the reactions that we've seen in the past. Now, mainly when we saw this in the past, we used a diatomic halogen and water. But I think we did briefly talk about how it doesn't have to be a diatomic halogen in water. It can be a diatomic halogen in pretty much any other nucleophile, especially alcohols. In fact, those are in your handout. In your handout, it talks about diatomic halogens and water or alcohols. So here we have an alcohol that's coming in as the uh, second attacker. Now, we use some very important techniques for synthesis here that you want to try to use on your own. One crucial technique is numbering. Try to get into the habit of numbering. The purpose of the numbers is to tell you which carbons in one picture are the same as the carbons in a different picture. This carbon over here is the same as this one, so they should get the same number. And that was really helpful here for articulating where the double bond used to be between the number one and the number two. Another technique I used here is, as soon as possible, make your intermediates look like your product. Notice how at this point I started drawing the intermediate so it would look like the product. Try to draw your intermediate so they look like the product. That will make it easier for you to think through the remaining steps. Okay, now how did I come up with this? How could you come up with this uh, on your own? So uh, does this mechanism make sense? Yes. All right, so let's see how, how you could come up with that. Well, do we not need to do Uh, yeah, that's a good point over here. Well, the product here, they didn't seem to be focusing on the stereochemistry, so we didn't focus on the stereochemistry. We actually would get two enantiomers here, I suppose, because this is a stereocenter, but because they weren't focusing on the stereochemistry and the synthesis, we didn't need to focus on it. Or actually, another way to put it is, what this really means is, if, if, if they draw something that's a stereocenter, but they don't use dashes and wedges, technically that really means that you have both enantiomers. Well, that's okay. We were going to get both enantiomers from the synthesis that we did, but I don't know if they want you to think about that. Right. The, key, the key thing is to think about how we came up with this synthesis. Well, one key thing is notice, it was pretty clear, I think, to you guys that the double bond used to be like this. One, two, three. So this was the original core of the molecule uh, over here. And then I asked, what are we adding? Well, we're adding a halogen and an oxygen. So I have to ask, do I any know, know any reactions that add a halogen and an oxygen? And that's really how I came up with this over here, that we're adding the halogen and the oxygen. The other point here is, this right here, do you guys know what type of functional group this is with an oxygen attached to two carbon chains? Ester. Now, actually, an ester, you guys haven't really gone over esters much this semester. An ester would look like this. You guys haven't really gone into esters much. Well, an this is an ether. Yeah. That's right. No, and the name isn't crucial here, but this is an ether. Anyway, the key point is, what functional group did this used to be when it attacked the double bond? An alcohol. An alcohol, but that's the part that's very hard for, for people to come up with. It's hard for people to realize that before this attacked the double bond, it was an alcohol, because it doesn't have the hydrogen anymore. Because this has deprotonated in the reaction, it doesn't look like an alcohol anymore. And that's one of the biggest obstacles to people coming up with this starting material over here. They don't even think of alcohols because there's no hydrogen over here. So we have to get into the habit when we're looking at the final product. If you're asking yourself, what is it that made that final product, remember that some of the atoms in the final product might have had an additional hydrogen before they attacked. Very likely, some of the atoms had an additional hydrogen before they attacked, which means they look like different functional groups. Before this oxygen attacked, it looked like an alcohol. So you've got to watch out for that. 
uh, after it deprotonates, it doesn't look like an alcohol anymore. So that's, I think, one of the most useful synthesis techniques. Remember that an atom might have had an extra hydrogen before it attacked. 